All righty, everyone. Uh, it is about that time, so I will get into my introductory uh, spiel. My name is Peter. I am your host here to, for tonight's Berkshire Museum Trivia Night. Tonight's theme is cats, dogs, and the weather. Now, uh, due to the limitations of the technology I have, I ask that you keep track of your scores at home, so grab a uh, pen, pencil, and a piece of paper. Uh, and as always, do not use the internet to find out any of the answers to tonight's quiz. I cannot enforce that rule. I am just asking that you follow it. All righty. Uh, we have 10 questions tonight, five on cats and dogs, five on the weather. If you would like to watch this uh, a video of this trivia or would like to see videos of the previous trivias we have done, you can find them on uh, our website, explore.berkshiremuseum.org. All righty. All right, we are going to go off to our first question. Once again, Berkshire Museum Trivia Night, as hosted by me, Peter Liffers. <laughs> all righty. Uh, now, all of the animal pictures you see here were contributed by my fellow employees at the Berkshire Museum. So these are all Berkshire Museum uh, employee dogs and cats that you'll see for all of our pictures here. Now, here we see JJ. He is out in the field. Uh, he is, in fact, outstanding in his field of being a dog. Yes, there's a lot of these. Uh, now, when he is out in the field, he is surrounded by green grass, brown dirt, blue sky, uh, gray squirrels. Uh, however, there is a common myth that dogs can only see in black and white. However, a lot of behavioral tests, tests have shown that dogs can actually see two colors on the color spectrum. So it is largely grayscale. However, there are two colors that it appears dogs are capable of seeing. So my question for all of you guys is, which colors are dogs able to see? Is it blue and yellow, blue and red, green and yellow, or purple and red? So just answer on the poll, or you can just keep track of what you answered at home if that works better for you. Uh, so. Dogs are capable of seeing two colors based on behavioral tests. Uh, so these are the two colors that scientists think dogs can see. Is it blue and yellow, blue and red, green and yellow, or purple and red? And we'll give you just another few seconds on those answers. All righty, we're going to wrap up our voting there. Uh, now, most of you guessed that blue and red was the color that dogs are able to see. Uh, in fact, based off of studies, the two colors that dogs are likely able to see are blue and yellow. So they can see blue and yellow. They cannot see red or green or purple or orange. So... For a dog, their world is all shades of blue, yellow, and then grayscale for the rest, um, which does help explain why dogs can sometimes have trouble finding a red ball on a green lawn. To them, that's all gray. Uh, however, blue or yellow, those might actually stand out a bit more. All righty, so that was our first dog question. We are now going to move on to our lovely feline friends. Uh, we see one here giving us a great big uh, stretch. Now, this here is an orange tabby. Uh, now, tabby is not an actual breed of cat. It is merely a description of the fur pattern. So it is that uh, any sort of stripey, some there's a spotted tabby, um, which is, again, sort of spots along the normal tabby straight lines. And then, of course, you've probably seen them in a lot of cat food commercials because they're very popular there. The ones that have the big swirl on the side, the sort of like almost like a hurricane tabby. Um, it's just a type of coat color common in house cats. 
however, uh, a lot of tabbies are said to have a particular letter on their forehead. So which letter might you find on the forehead of a tabby? This letter is often said to be a description of what's right there on their forehead. Uh, tabby is a very good coloration for cats as they are predators and those stripe patterns do help block out the body while they're hunting their prey through low brush and like tall grass or small bushes. Uh, and it helps them be, you know, be the best predator they can be. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I am always monitoring that as well. If you got any questions about tonight. All right. Give you a couple more seconds on those guesses. Uh, when you look at a tabby, this letter is often said to be on the forehead of tabbies. Is it a W, H, M, or V? All right, we're going to end our polling there. A lot of you guys went with W, which is very fair. It does often look like W. However, the letter often said to be on the forehead of cats is the letter M, which is best exemplified by our friend here. This, this poor cat, unfortunately, wandered into a shower uh, and decided to sit on the toilet and loudly complain about it until it felt that its complaints were heard. But uh, on their forehead, you can see that sort of classic little M right above the eyes. This is called the mackerel tabby pattern. Uh, however, oftentimes you'd probably see a W or an H, but uh, tabby patterns are often described as having an M on the forehead of the cat. All right, here we have the mythical lunicorn. Uh, this is, of course, Luna the dog. She is out exploring the snowy weather uh, in her unicorn onesie. Uh, and as a very, very thin connection, the unicorn is the national animal of Scotland. And that got me thinking about Scottish dogs and what dogs originate from those hilly regions. So I have picked four British dogs. And I want you guys to guess for me which one originates in Scotland. So if you had to guess, which of these dog breeds was first created in Scotland? They all originate from the British Isles. Only one of these dogs originates in Scotland. And I will now... I apologize deeply to anyone who is from Scotland or has family there. Attempt to read them in a terrible Scottish accent. All right, we've got the uh, Cardigan Corgi. We've got the Cairn Terrier. we got an Air Dare Terrier. Oh, God, this Scottish accent is so bad, and I apologize, everyone, but we're almost done. Or is it the Wheaton Terrier? There's too many R's for me to do a Scottish accent. That is, that is rough for me. I'll probably do it in... It's hard for an Irish. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll do Irish for it. We've got a cardigan corgi, a cairn terrier, an air terrier terrier, or a wheaton terrier. That was less offensive than the Scottish one. Again, I apologize uh, wholeheartedly um, to the entire nation of Scotland and the Scottish people for the accent I attempted tonight. All right, uh, we've got our votes in. I'm going to wrap up our voting there. Uh, share the results. Uh, with a slight lead, um, at just 50% of the vote, we have the Cairn Terrier. And you guys are correct. The Cairn Terrier is native to, uh, it did originate in Scotland. The Cardigan Corgi, uh, like all corgis, originates in Wales. The Airedale Terrier is from England. And the Wheaton Taylor Terrier, uh, that originates just over the Irish Sea in Ireland. Uh, so great guesses on that. Now, we have our black and white, our black cat friend here giving us some good paw action on the rug. Now, uh, it is often said that uh, polydactyl cats are more common in New England uh, simply due to those were, it was a genetic trait 
commonly found in cats when cats were initially brought to New England. Uh, polydactyl means cats with extra toes. Uh, so uh, there's some anecdotal evidence and some real evidence uh, to suggest that uh, the cats found in New England are more likely to have extra toes than a lot of other places. Um, now, polydactyl cats can have, have more toes than a normal cat has. Uh, but my question for you guys is, how many toes does a normal cat have? Uh, so we are looking for the number of toes that a cat is supposed to have. So this is not a polydactyl cat, a cat with extra fingers. How many toes does a normal cat have? So you know all those cats that look like they have a thumb? Those are polydactyl cats. We want cats that look like they have no, uh, sort of the standard cat paw, not the bonus finger cat paw. I will give you a hint. Cats do have more front, uh, front toes than back toes. It's my only hint. I'm not giving you any numbers. All right, a couple more seconds on those answers. All right, and we are going to wrap up our voting there. So squeaking out with a very slim 50%, 16 toes is the guesses for our group tonight. Uh, 18 and 20 are tied. Uh, if you have a standard non-polydactyl cat, they have 18 toes. They have one more uh, toe on each front paw than their back paws. If their back paws match the front, they would have 20 in total, but they are short one, uh, one toe on the back paws. Uh, so cats have uh, usually 18, any more than that, and you have yourself a polydactyl cat, a cat with extra, with extra fingers. All right, and here we have our friend Doggett uh, staring down the long road, getting ready for a good run. Uh, dogs are, uh, surprising, uh, unsurprisingly, a very, very fast uh, companion to humans. Uh, we have dogs specifically bred to run at very high speeds, including the greyhound and whippets and Italian greyhounds. However, there are also a number of hunting dogs capable of great speeds as well, as well as herding dogs. Uh, a lot of these working dogs need to run as fast as possible. Uh, Irish wolfhounds are another non-racing hound that is incredibly fast. Greyhounds, uh, not greyhounds, um, Great Danes are another very, very surprisingly fast dog given their very long legs. Now, my question for you guys is, how fast can the fastest dogs go? Uh, this is not a fastest breed question, as there have been several breeds to all clock in at around the same top speed. Uh, so this is an official top speed. There have been anecdotal, uh, unconfirmed reports of dogs running slightly faster than the highest recorded top speed. So can dog, uh, the, how, was the, how fast was the fastest dog run ever, uh, ever officially recorded? Was it 26 miles an hour, 32 miles per hour, 36 miles an hour, or a whopping 41 miles per hour? And I want you guys to picture in your mind greyhounds, Italian greyhounds, Irish wolfhounds, German shepherds, dogs just bolting as fast as they can. Do not, under any circumstances, picture a bulldog or a French bulldog especially, those dogs will move about three feet before they go take a nap. Now, granted, your greyhounds will also just run once incredibly fast, and then they will sleep the rest of the day, but we're not talking bulldogs here. We are talking greyhounds, wolfhounds, and shepherds. All righty, we're going to end our polling there. All right, it seems that most of you went with, uh, with a plurality of the vote, 36 miles an hour, uh, which is a pretty good guess. That is pretty fast. And However, a greyhound was tracked 
at 41.7 miles per hour. So I rounded down a little bit here, but 41 miles per hour. Uh, there have also been reports of uh, Irish wolfhounds and German shepherds also clocking uh, 40 plus miles an hour while at top speed. They do not hold the speed for very long, but they have hit over 40 miles per hour while running at a full gait. So that was our last cats and dogs question. We are now turning our attention to the weather. So I'm sure you are all familiar with these particular types of storms known for their large central eyes and intense winds that surround them. Uh, these are various tropical cyclones. Uh, now we, the reason we were delayed this week is because one of these, uh, not fully formed, caused a little bit of heavy winds, heavy rains, and power outages on Tuesday. Now, these tropical uh, cyclones, depending on where you are in the world, have different names. So my question for everyone here is, which is not a name for these massive cyclonic storms? So depending on where you are in the world, they all have different names. Which is not a name for one of these cyclonic storms? Is it hurricane, typhoon? Monsoon or cyclone? And of course, uh, for us here in our section of the world, when these flow through, we give them alphabetical names. Uh, you know, Isaac, Bob, uh, and we name the storms as they flow through our region here. All right, just a few more seconds on those guesses. All righty, we're going to end our polling there. And it was pretty runaway for you guys. So uh, Monsoon taking the lead. You guys are 100% correct. Monsoons are massive rainstorms. However, they are not cyclonic storms. Uh, so uh, monsoons are caused by uh, the seasonal changes, uh, in, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, where you see them a lot, uh, with wet, warm air hitting the uh, Himalayas, condensing, and coming down in massive, massive rainstorms. So uh, monsoons are incredibly heavy rainstorms. However, they lack the spinning high wind eye structure that is indicative of a cyclonic storm. Uh, speaking of intense winds whipping around in a cone, uh, there is the much uh, more focused uh, windstorm that is a tornado. Now, uh, tornadoes are uh, big in fiction. It is how uh, you arrive to, uh, you know, the land of Oz uh, that is famous for whipping bad CGI cows across the screen uh, and for crazy people driving around in trucks that will nail themselves to the ground because they want to measure the wind forces of a tornado. Uh, and you have your, your storm chasers who are uh, just a little bit bonkers driving out chasing these tornadoes in order to get collect data on them. Now, my question for you guys is, uh, in which country, uh, which country has the highest number of tornadoes a year? So which country in the world experiences more tornadoes than anyone else? Is it the United States, Australia, South Africa, or Russia? If you had to guess which of these states uh, has more tornadoes than anyone else, who would it be? Alrighty. You got your votes in quick on that one. So we are going to wrap up a little bit early on that question. Uh, pretty runaway uh, lead for the United States there. 
Uh, and you guys would be 100% correct. In fact, Canada is the second has the second highest number of uh, tornadoes a year. This is due to the geological structure of the United States, uh, the Rocky Mountains, uh, followed by the Plains, uh, basically create a channel where uh, warm air from the Caribbean, cold air from the Arctic slam together and create the ideal conditions to create huge numbers of tornadoes throughout the year. Uh, you do, there are plenty of other places in the world that get tornadoes. However, the geological structure of the United States uh, with those sort of mountains channeling uh, uh, the wind creates the ideal conditions to create huge numbers of tornadoes every year. All right, now we go from heavy winds to freezing temperatures. Uh, now the uh, temperature record keeping has gone back for hundreds of years in Massachusetts. Uh, the coldest temperature ever recorded in the state of Massachusetts was recorded here in the Berkshires. Uh, now, uh, it is not on top of a mountain, surprisingly. Uh, the coldest temperature ever recorded in New England was, of course, re recorded on the top of Mount Washington. Uh, however, uh, it is in one of the hill towns, which I forgot to write down in my notes, and I am going to quickly Google and get you the name while I have you guys answering the question, all right? All righty. Uh, so my question for you guys is, what was the coldest temperature ever recorded in the state of Massachusetts. Is it minus 52 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 40 degrees, minus 39 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 36 degrees Fahrenheit? Uh, just an additional fun fact about minus 40 degrees. It is actually the same temperature in both Fahrenheit and Celsius. That is the temperature at which they overlap. Coldest temperature was recorded in Chester, Mass. It was in Chester. All right, just a few more seconds on your guesses. What is the coldest temperature ever recorded in the state of Massachusetts? All right, it looks like we have all of our votes in, and it was pretty split amongst the group. Uh, one third thinking it was minus 52 degrees, another thinking it was minus 40, and another group thinking it's a little slightly warmer at minus 36. The answer is minus 40 degrees uh, was recorded in Chester. Uh, again, minus 40 degrees. You don't have to bother specifying Fahrenheit or Celsius. It is minus 40 either way. Uh, right. So that is the coldest temperature ever recorded in Massachusetts. Uh, the, now we're going to go to the reverse end and think about the hottest temperature ever recorded in the state. The hottest temperature was 107 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, now, while the coldest temperature was unsurprisingly recorded in the mountains, the hottest temperature unsurprisingly is recorded down by the coast. So my question for you guys is, in which town in Massachusetts was the highest temperature recorded in? Uh, it, was it Provincetown all the way out at the end of the Cape? Uh, was it Situate just south of Boston, Gloucester just north of Boston, or New Bedford down on the south coast out towards Rhode Island? So if you had to guess which town in Massachusetts saw the hottest temperature ever recorded in the state at 107 degrees Fahrenheit. So the, your uh, options again are Provincetown in, out on the end of the Cape, Situate, which is just south of Boston, Gloucester, which is just north of Boston, or New Bedford, which is out closer to Rhode Island. Uh, other fun facts, uh, Provincetown has the largest granite monument in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, Situate uh, is a town that I lived in for quite a while. Uh, Gloucester is difficult for some people to pronounce, and New Bedford has a whaling museum. These are inconsequential fun facts about these various towns. Alrighty, we're going to wrap up our voting there. Uh, 
just eking it out with the plurality of the votes is New Bedford. And everyone who guessed that guessed correctly. New Bedford recorded the highest temperature so far in the state of Massachusetts. Alrighty, guys, we are coming towards the end of our night. And I think it's time we debunk some classic weather myths. Uh, uh, you see here, uh, the first one I'm debunking is that, uh, well, not really debunking. The first one here is no two snowflakes look alike. Uh, well, we have a few that are fairly similar. However, snowflakes kind of look alike when they are in the upper atmosphere. It's only as they descend through the layers of the atmosphere that the ice crystals begin to form these complex shapes. While they're all in the upper atmosphere, scientists have found out they kind of all exist in the same crystalline form, but as they sort of melt and reform as they make their way down to the Earth, they begin these complex, uh, very unique ice structures. So the answer is technically, all snowflakes kind of start out the same, but then become unique as they approach the Earth. So that is the first myth we're, we're busting. And the second one is, it can be too cold to snow, true or false. So is it true or false? Uh, it can be too cold to snow. This is a common, common statement one hears in the winter. Oh, good, it is getting really cold now. It won't snow. Alrighty, we're going to give just a couple more seconds and then get to the answer. Alrighty, we have two thirds of the group voting that it is true that it can be too cold to snow. And the answer is false. Uh, it can snow at pretty much any temperature. However, when it becomes extremely cold, the air usually becomes much drier, making snow far less likely. However, snow has been recorded at pretty much every temperature, uh, especially in the freezing temperatures. So snow can happen at pretty much any freezing temperature. However, it's the dry air that typically accompanies colder temperatures that is what's causing the lack of snow. However, you can get freezing, deep, deep freezing temperatures and still have enough moisture in the air to create snow. Uh, other environmental factors like lakes uh, can further increase the amount of snow despite low temperatures. Alrighty, that is usually our last question for the night. I do have one last question for everyone though. Uh, and it goes out to all of these animals. Uh, I had a whole mess of uh, pet pics from my coworkers. Uh, so I wanna give a special shout out to all of the pets who uh, were able to contribute their beautiful faces to the game tonight. And my final question for you all is, aren't these, are these pets adorable? And your choices are yes, definitely, absolutely. So my final question is, all those pets you just saw on the previous page, are they adorable? And your answers are yes, definitely, or absolutely. Fun fact, you can also vote multiple times on this particular question. <laughs> all right, we'll give you another couple of uh, seconds to confirm what we all know to be true, that these are indeed an adorable group of pets. And we'll wrap it up there, guys. I would not make you choose uh, from the chat. I would not make you choose at all. These, this is a multiple, multiple choice answer. You can select every single one. All right, guys. Uh, that's it for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me on this later version of Berkshire Family Trivia Night. 